Hi, I'm Tom Havis and what we present is a few vignettes of diagnostic techniques and pathologies that we see at our um, speech and swallowing clinic. And I'm very proud of the fact that we established an integrated voice and swallowing clinic 25 years ago and since then we've stayed at the forefront of both clinical and ac academic research about conditions of the larynx, how to diagnose them, how to treat them, how to treat them in a less invasive and more effective way. Intercurrently, we were among the first to integrate endoscopic evaluation of swallowing and our understanding about the etiology of a variety of swallowing disorders, both related to disease and to ageing, continues to evolve, so we're able to provide a much better standard of care for our patients. I hope you enjoy the videos that I present. And if you have any questions about these or anything else, please feel free to contact me through Havis ENT Clinics. To examine the voice box in the upper ear digestive tract, we use two types of telescopes. We use flexible telescopes that are inserted through the nose. They're well tolerated and they allow us to look at the voice box during jointed speech in a dynamic sort of situation. Alternatively, we can put a rigid telescope in the mouth. This is less well tolerated, gives us a static view of the voice box on the top of the swallowing tube, but because the tube is wider, we get a clearer image with more magnification. Usually both of these instruments are used in any individual patient to optimally assess the voice box and the surrounding swallowing tube. The larynx is a complex structure which evolved essentially to protect the airway from the inhalation of food and saliva. You can see that it sits in the Adam's apple just above the trachea. When we look at it from the back, you get some idea of the complexity of the structure with the numerous little muscles that are necessary to control movement of the true vocal folds and the false vocal cords. In this section you see that these muscles here are the true vocal folds and above them there's a parallel group of muscles called the false vocal folds. In the side-on view, you can see that the muscles between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, which are outside the voice box proper, are very important in lengthening and shortening the vocal folds by tilting the thyroid cartilage on the cricoid cartilage. This is a normal female larynx taken with a rigid telescope using stroboscopic or high-speed imaging to look at the movement of the vocal cords in slow motion. This is a similar picture of a normal male and you can see the lining over the vocal folds vibrating over the muscle. This modulates the column of air and generates sound. And this third video that we're about to see is a normal child. You can see how the larynx is much shorter, the vocal folds are finer, but the procedure is tolerated in children over the age of five as a rule of thumb. Pre-nodular thickening of the larynx is probably the most common benign pathology and is due to inappropriate or overuse of the voice. Focus here and you'll see little thickenings at the free edge of the cords. In patient two, I'll demonstrate that again. Again, focus your attention here and you can see these two little white dots where they're almost like pre-calluses starting to form on the vocal folds. Pre-nodular thickenings are entirely benign, do not require surgical intervention, and respond very well to speech therapy. Nodules, on the other hand, represent a more advanced form of the same process. Here you can see that the thickenings are much larger, more organised. A callus has formed. Nodules are classified as being either small, intermediate, or large, soft, intermediate or hard. Small soft nodules are dealt with conservatively whereas large hard nodules often require surgical removal and then adjuvant speech therapy to reverse the inappropriate pattern of vocal fold usage that led to their formation. Vocal fold polyps are usually due to voice abuse and or reflux. This is a large pedunculated polyp which has had a bleed into it 
and is associated with gastroesophageal reflux. In patient two, we demonstrate an even larger polyp on the cephalic margin of the vocal cord. These lesions are appropriately treated surgically with appropriate histopathological evaluation. A variety of microsurgical techniques is available. This is a much smaller vocal fold polyp and is seen in a professional voice user after a vigorous performance. This polyp with conservative management will involute. Pre-malignant lesions of the larynx are usually due to a combination of smoking, drinking, gastroesophageal reflux or all three. You can see this abnormal area on the left vocal fold. Appropriate treatment for that would have been surgical excision and appropriate histopathological evaluation. This is a smaller area of carcinoma in situ which would be managed the same way. In patient 3, we again demonstrate a lengthy area of leukoplakia, or white plaque in the larynx, which is never normal, often premalignant, and is appropriately treated as discussed before. Um, squamous cell carcinoma of the larynx is still the most common cancer. Here we see a large, bulky cancer on the left vocal fold. This particular cancer was treated by pure oral laser vaporization without the need for adjuvant therapy. In patient 2, there is a larger cancer involving the false vocal cords and the epiglottis. This patient required a total laryngectomy for appropriate treatment of their condition. And in patient 3, we're demonstrating another area of localised cancer in the left vocal fold. There was involvement of the paraglottic space so this patient was treated with external beam radiotherapy. Reflux-induced pharyngolaryngitis, or changes in the larynx associated with reflux are very common. You can see here that there's an increased vascularity of the cords. They're redder, they're thicker, and the surrounding area is also inflamed. Similarly, in patient two, you will notice that there are the lining is thickened at the back of the larynx and overlying the vocal cord due to the ongoing irritation of acid coming up from the stomach, irritating and soiling the larynx. These changes called reflux-induced pharyngolaryngitis are very common in terms of laryngeal disorders. Chronic laryngitis can be caused by anything that irritates the larynx long term the most common cause is smoking. It leads to bogginess of the free edge of the vocal cords and redness of the larynx and the surrounding tissues. In patient two, again with chronic laryngitis, you get a better idea of the thickening and the floppiness of the free edge of the vocal cord. The lining is thickened but remains normal. One of the most common neurological conditions that we see in the larynx is altered movement of the vocal folds. This patient has a paresis with reduced movement of one vocal fold, and you can see that when the vocal cords come together, there's a gap which allows air to escape and is the reason for the generally breathy and weak voice. Similarly to stroboscopic examination, you can see that there's much more movement in one vocal cord than the other, and as in patient three, there still remains reasonably good compensation and good voice. When this paresis or weakness becomes a paralysis, there's a lot of wasting of the vocal cord as you can see, and the gap between the vocal cords is much greater, so the voice is much weaker and much breathier. Again demonstrated in patient two, long-standing vocal fold paralysis associated with wasting, and a weak, breathy voice. We have developed a system of injecting these paralyzed vocal cords through the mouth with the patient's own fat to bulk the vocal cord up and to restore the voice to normal. We've done over 300 of these cases and the results are very promising. This patient has a bilateral superior laryngeal nerve paralysis. You can see the movement disorder is more subtle and the patient has lost the ability to lengthen their vocal fold 
which is characteristic of superior laryngeal nerve paralysis. This lesion most commonly occurs after thyroid surgery. Unlike a paralysis of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, superior laryngeal nerves pauses are left with large phonatory gaps, particularly if they're bilateral, and these cases are usually well treated by peroral augmentation with the patient's own fat. Some of the fat that we inject is reabsorbed, but about 70% of it remains in the long term, and the results we've had with voice improvement are excellent. Again, another case of a one-sided vocal fold paralysis. Can you start to pick the difference? One, the movement of one vocal cord is completely normal. There is good lengthening of the vocal cord, whereas the paralyzed vocal cord has no mucosal wave and very little movement. I'll show you one more case and soon you'll become expert at differentiating between one-sided vocal fold paralysis due to recurrent laryngeal nerve injury and or superior laryngeal nerve paralysis. Um, a worrying condition in the elderly is la laryngeal tremor. Just as with age you can get tremor of your limbs or your hands, you can see the tremor in this larynx, the involuntary movement that occurs overriding and interfering with voluntary vocal cord movement. This is a difficult age-related condition to treat. The treatment is usually by the use of medication, beta blockers at appropriate doses, but we have to be very careful not to lower the blood pressure to the point where these elderly people may get periods of low blood pressure and may fall or faint. And just to finish up, I'll show you a few more examples of normal larynges with normal movement. Nice white vocal cords, symmetrical mucosal wave, good closure from front to back, no inflammation or swelling of the surrounding tissue. And then in a normal child or female, the same features apply. The larynx is smaller, nice white vocal folds, good mucosal wave, no inflammation of the surrounding tissue, no lining abnormalities. Um, I hope you've enjoyed these vignettes of laryngeal pathology that we've presented. Sydney Voice Clinic continues to be at the forefront of clinical and academic research and if I could be of any help to you or your patients, please don't hesitate to contact me.